Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Assalamu alaikum and welcome to the Saturday edition of Let's Talk with me, Julie Ali. And of course, we beaming out from the ITV studios in Sunning Hill, Johannesburg. Now, on Wednesday, we wrapped up the show with Sheikh um, Zubair Malachwa. We were talking about the Mubarak month of Ramadan. We spoke about uh, the Juma Mosque in El Dorado Park and we touched on a reversion to Islam. He himself reverted to Islam at the tender age of nine and then he went on to the Darul Ulum and in the process has uh, gotten his whole family in the fold of Islam. Alhamdulillah, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept all of their efforts. And then, of course, we were wanting to look at other issues, uh, the 30 days of Ramadan, broken up into three segments, the first 10 days being mercy, the second 10 days in which we are currently now, the days of forgiveness, and the last 10 days of emancipation. It is the time of uh, that night, which is greater than a thousand months, the night of Qadr. And of course, we all look for that, powerful night, the night of power in uh, Itikaf, and we're going to talk about the concept of Itikaf. Later on in the show, we're going to be talking about Ramadan in Eid markets, and we're also going to be talking about um, a book on how to improve yourself, and the author of the book is Kathy Mann. But right now, something very close to my heart, Alhamdulillah, Allah has blessed us with spirituality, and we are embracing the month of Ramadan. Let's welcome. Sheikh Zubair Malachwa. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Alhamdulillah, jazakallahu khairan. I'm happy to meet you again, Amin. Alhamdulillah, and with your du'as, we are once again back together on ITV talking about this Mubarak month of Ramadan that Allah Ameen. has blessed us. Ameen. And let's talk about the concepts, um, the three concepts that we Ameen. aspire to in the month of Ramadan. Ameen. It is mercy, Ameen. it is forgiveness, and of course, emancipation. Amen, amen, amen. Let's look at mercy. What exactly? And I know it's behind us, but amen, that doesn't amen. mean we forget about it. I mean, I mean, I mean. So, how do we as Muslims embrace the concept of mercy? Amen, amen. How do we, how do we work on this concept and make sure that we touch lives in a merciful and a respectful way? I mean, Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. In the name of Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala, the most forgiving the most merciful. You know, <clears throat> in the, when we're talking about the mercy of Allah, all of us, we want the mercy of Allah. In order for us to, you know, to go to Jannah, it's not because of the justice. We, do not, we don't want the justice of Allah, but we want the mercy of Allah. That's why we always make a dua, Allahumma rahmataka naruju. O Allah, your mercy is our desire. Do not leave us to our own description. We really need the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, how can we attain the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? You know, they say each and every day we are living, there are five angels come down to give us some advice. You know, the first one said, Man taraka fara'id Allah. The one who left out the fara'id of Allah. You know, such as salah fasting, zakah, things which Allah made obligatory upon him, that person, yuhramin rahmatillah, is not going to have the mess of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So how to attain the mess of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? We need to obey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We need to do what Allah told us to do. And in the process, sometimes we might fall into the sins and then we stand again and ask Allah forgiveness and then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will forgive us. That's why this month of Ramadan, it's about mercy, you know, the forgiveness and free from the fire of Jahannam. But it doesn't really mean that, you know, when we pass the 10 days of mercy, the mercy of Allah is not there. You know, the entire month is full of mercy, it's full of forgiveness, it's full of emancipating. You know, so we need, you know, to ask for the mercy. This is the dua which we need to, you know, to make every day. Allahumma rahmataka narju wa la takinna tarafatan a'in. O oh Allah, your mercy is our desire. Do not leave us to our own description. Because he's the one who can change the, you can, the one who can your change, condition. you know, you can change the condition. So sometimes when Allah favors us, for example, we are going to Salah, we are performing, we do not shame others who are not coming for Salah. Because we don't know what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala do. 
Allah can change the heart at any time. That's why the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam used to teach us to make a dua. Ya muqallib al-qulub. O you changer of the heart. Thabbit qalbi ala dinika. You know, guide my heart towards the religion. For verily Allah can change, you know, the heart at any time. Alhamdulillah. MashaAllah. Allah is merciful. Is One of Allah's names is mercy. Allah is 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 forgiving and is merciful yes, yes allah is rahma yes 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 but in our everyday lives and very especially in the month of ramadan and yes. i you know it doesn't mean when i say especially in the month of ramadan yes. that after ramadan we must forget uh, yes, being yes, yes. merciful yes yes we have to we want we we begging allah for his mercy yes, yes but yes. how are we being merciful for, to the people around us how should we behave and how should we live so mm. that we project this mercy and this respect. I mean, I mean, I mean. You know, the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, مَنْ يَسَّرَ عَلَى مُعْسِرٍ يَسَّرَ اللَّهُ فِي الدُّنْيَا وَالْآخِرَةِ The one who make it easy upon Muslim into this dunya. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will make it easy upon him in this dunya as well in the akhira. So, if you want Allah, you want the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then you have to be, you know, you know, you have to show mercy to others as well. You know, you have to make it easy upon, you know, other Muslims, you know, like the hadith says. But if you want to make difficult upon other Muslims, and then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala definitely is going also to make difficult upon you. So if you want your life to change, if you want the mercy of Allah, you know, to be on you, then it's easy. Then you have mercy on others as well. And then definitely Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the mercy will be upon you. And we always pray for the mercy of Allah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for verily people they are going to Jannah only because the mercy of Allah. And when we talk mercy it's not uh, it's not a concept beyond our understanding. Yes, yes, yes. Being merciful is being kind, it's and being kind, respectful, yes. the it's about kind, yes. the, the people in your immediate environment. It could be a husband and wife who's been having a lot of problems in their yes, marriage yes, yes. but take this opportunity in the month of Ramadan, 30 yes. days. 30 days yes. We're not saying just be merciful yes, in the yes. first in 10 the days. days. No, 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 be no. merciful throughout, the, your life. throughout your life. Embrace yes, yes, the yes. concept. So yes, be yes. merciful to your husband, your wife, your mother, your mother-in-law, your children. And obviously that goodness, that Rahma is yes, going yes. to permeate the entire environment. Yes, 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 yes. You know, like I said, as a Muslim, you know, you need to show mercy. You know, you need to have mercy with you. You know, be it, you know, to your wife and to your kids. You know, sometimes, you know, we had some people, you know, who are so soft-kinded when, when, when they are outside. When they speak, they are so soft. But when they come to their own house, you know, they are unruly. They're tyrants. Yeah, they are tyrants, you know. <laughs> so... You know, you should start at home. You know, remember, you have your wife. You know, you need to show mercy upon her. You have the and kids. mercy yes. is kindness. It's when kind, we talk yeah. mercy, we're talking kindness yes. and respect. And respect. You know, it doesn't mean that, you know, she is your wife or maybe uh, they are your children and then you have to speak the way you want to speak. You know, you have to choose the words. Because remember the words which you can just throw, you know, words once spoken can never be retained. You know, you know. Sometimes you might say something that can hit someone. So we need to watch out our tongue. That's why the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said that if you control al lisani the tongue, and then verily Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can give us jannah. And, and you should be especially merciful to perhaps your workers, people who work for you. Yes, exactly. I mean, that's a wonderful way of getting rahmah, mercy from rahma, Allah subhanahu yes, wa ta'ala yes, 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 yes. for receiving Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's yes, blessings. Yes, yes, so yes. your loved ones, people in your immediate environment, it's no good being kind and soft and gentle, and gentle outside yes, of your home or outside of the yes, workplace. Yes, yes. But when you come in with your workers or with your family, yes, you're yes. a horrible tyrant. Yes, yes, yes. If you take a look at the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, you are sent is what? Is a mess to the mankind. Absolutely. You know, humanity in large. It doesn't mean that, you know, you see, sometimes people think that, you know, uh, for example, you have a worker who is not a Muslim and then you have to treat him the way you like. And then you ask him, brother, why are you treating me this? I know he's not a Muslim. So it doesn't matter that, you know, Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa was sent to all mankind as mercy from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we need to take it sooner. And we're not talking about the mess, even also to the animals as well. You know, there are some people who might keep the dogs at home, but they're not giving them food. You know, you know, a hadith in, you know, one of, um, you know, the women, you know, the cell worker, uh, 
she entered Jannah because she gave, you know, <coughs> she gave, you know, uh, uh, water to a thirsty dog, dog yes. you know, and she entered Jannah because of that. And you know the story of one, uh, one woman who entered Jahannam because she kept a cat, you know, and she never fed the cat. Mm. You see, so we need also to, to show the mess to the animals. And when we talk, you know, you're talking animals, you're talking mankind, we mustn't forget our sisters, our mothers, our, our daughters, mothers, yes. um, they are often trodden upon. Yes, Be merciful yes, yes. to them. Yes, and, yes. And, and our beloved Nabi Karim sallallahu alayhi wa sallam emancipated women 1439 years amin, ago. Amin, amin, he amin. gave the, the greatest man who walked on earth, emancipated amin, women. Amin, amin, the amin. Western world is only coming to that realization amin, amin. in the 21st century. Amin, amin, amin. And he made women equal. Sahih. But we still find this oppression happening in our homes and our communities. So mercy yeah, is a yeah. concept that needs to be applied here as well exactly with gender issues exactly you see especially you know you're talking about the toy, the point about the mothers you know we see the youngsters nowadays they're no more respecting their parents you know their mothers you know the pro Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said in the whole Quran you know we made we made combos upon you know the insan you know the human being to be good we made them to be good to your parents umuhu your mother Wahinan ala wahinin, who carries you in difficult times. Wallahi, when you're speaking to our mothers, we need to choose the words. You know, we need to have mercy. You know, sometimes they might be old. You know, we find, you know, the youth, when they're speaking to the mother, said, hey, this old lady, what is she talking about? You know, remember, she suffered a lot in order for you to be who you are, you know, especially nowadays. So we need also to show mercy to our parents, you know, to our sisters, to humanity in large and to the animals as well. That way Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can shower our mess upon us and when Allah give us mess and then it is Jannah. Alhamdulillah. Let's Alhamdulillah. go for our first and break. I'm talking to Sheikh uh, Zubair Malotshwa. We're talking the 30 days of Ramadan, the 10 days of mercy, forgiveness and emancipation. To stay with us. We're halfway down the Mubarak month of Ramadan. We are talking with Sheikh Zubair Malachwa. We're talking the concepts of mercy, forgiveness and emancipation. And now let's talk forgiveness. We are in the 10 days of forgiveness. How powerful, how important is it for us to forgive? And how does mercy tie in with forgiveness? And how about those people? We all humans, we all have our nafs that overtakes our good intentions. Amen, amen. And we know that sometimes we bear grudges, even though I say to you, Marf, amen, when amen. Ramadan or the 15th of Shaban, we amen. phone and email everybody and ask for Marf. Amen. But shaitan overtakes us. Amen. I mean, I was just having a discussion with someone yesterday and she was telling Amen. me she's having a big Eid gathering at her house, but she's Amen. not going to be inviting a certain nephew to the house Amen. because Amen. he doesn't invite them ever. And the thought that went through my mind is, so Amen. where is your rahma, your Amen. mercy? Amen. Amen. Where's your forgiveness? Yeah. Amen. Where's Amen. your emancipation that you're going to make dua for in the Amen. last Amen. 10 days Amen. of Amen. Ramadan? Amen. Amen. Your thoughts? Well, Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. You know, we are in the month of forgiveness. Allah is dishing out, you know, is distributing forgiveness to everyone. You know, a loser is the one who doesn't, you know, receive the forgiveness from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And if we take a look on the virtue of forgiveness, wallahi, it can change our life. In the whole Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, when Nuh alayhi salam said, وَقُلْتُ اسْتَغْفِرُوا رَبَّكُمْ إِنَّهُ كَانَ غَفَّارًا I tell them that ask Allah forgiveness for verily he is al-ghaffara. Al-ghaffara means is the oft to forgive him. When Allah forgives you, now the mess is coming. يُرُسِلِ السَّمَاءَ عَلَيْكُمْ مِدْرَارًا He gives you the rain from the sky. You know, وَيُمْدِدِكُمْ بِأَمْوَالٍ وَبَنِينَا And you enrich you with your wealth and your children. And you put baraka in your wealth and your children. You know, if Allah doesn't put baraka in our wealth, 
and in our children sometimes we might have a lot of money in our account but we don't know where the money is going sometimes that we can just you know spend the money unnecessarily but if there is baraka you know you might earn little but if allah put baraka you can utilize that money uh, properly and if allah put baraka in your children they can you know become hafiz alims you know and they can help you even the time when you passed away you know so this is the month of forgiveness we need to ask allah a lot in the prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam taught something called sayyidul istighfar you know the master as far as forgiveness is concerned that it is a dua when you say this dua allah will forgive you your sins it started by allahumma anta rabbi oh allah you are my lord you are my lord you know you declare that you oh allah you are my lord la ilaha illa anta there is none worth of worship beside you allah khalaqtani you have created me wa ana abduk and i am your servant inni ala wa'dika wa ahdika ma stata'tu i am upon my pledge you know in my promises to you you know abu ulaka bin dhambi abu ulaka bin ni'mat alayya oh allah I'm admitting all the good things you've bestowed upon me. You know just to be a Muslim wallah it's a great favor from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Wa abu ula abdhambi in oh Allah I'm admitting my sins. Ya Allah I'm admitting my sins. And then you have to cry to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, regret to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and then said faghfir li. Oh Allah forgive me. Why? فَإِنَّهُ لَا يَغْفِرُ الذُّنُوبَ إِلَّا أَنْتَ For verily, there is none who can forgive the sins except you, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But we're begging and pleading and crying to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive us in these 10 days of forgiveness. And yet we can't forgive other people. But we want Allah to forgive us. But we can't show mercy and forgiveness to our brother and our sister and our in-laws. I mean, I mean. You know, this is the hadith which I've mentioned that, you know, may yassar ala mu'asirin, the one who make it easy upon a Muslim, upon someone who is in difficult, then Allah can make it easy upon himself. You know, if you forgive someone and then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can forgive you. You know, all of us want forgiveness. You know, all of us are sinners. Kullun bani Adam khattaun. All the children of Adam are the sinners. Wa khayru al khattaina, the best sinner, you know, At-tawwabuna, the one who asks Allah forgiveness. And when Allah forgives you, it can be two things. Either Allah can forgive you and delete the sin. Or if you ask Allah sincerely to forgive you, Allah, he can forgive you the sin, but he cannot delete that sin, but he can just convert that sin to become a good deed. Alhamdulillah. Okay, so let's apply our minds to that in these 10 days of forgiveness. Let us, we, you know, when we sit down on that musalla and when we ask Allah to forgive us and accept and be merciful to us, let us also think about how Amen. we've wronged other people in our Amen. lives Amen. Amen. and let Amen. us be forgiving or how other people have wronged us Amen. and Amen. let Amen. us forgive them. Amen. And Amen. by us Amen. forgiving them, Amen. let us ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to be merciful to us. Merciful. Now, the last 10 days of Ramadan is Amen. the day days of emancipation amen, we amen. all we look for that one night that night of power amen, the amen, night amen. of Laylatul Qadr amen, amen. and of course we do now alhamdulillah those brothers who are amen. you know have the health that amen. they go to the mosques and they sit in itikaf amen, explain amen. the concept of itikaf and amen, looking amen. for that night of power Amen, amen, the amen. night of uh, glory, the night which is better than a thousand months. I mean, Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Well, uh, I would like to, you know, to introduce this question with a hadith, you know, which was narrated by Ummul Mu'minin, the mother of the believers, Aisha, Hazrat Aisha, may Allah Subhanahu wa Taala be pleased with you. He described the way Nabi Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam used to take these last ten days. In us as Muslims, Wallahi, we need to take from Nabi Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So how did he take these last 10 days? How did he do itikaf? How did he, you know, what he used to do in the itikaf? You know, Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha, she said in a hadith, Kana idha dakhala ashr al-awakh. When the last 10 days come, the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, she described our noble Nabi Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, said, Jadda wajdahad, you know, Ahiya al-layl, that he used to strive a lot, and he used to make the night come to life, come to life. Ahiya al-layl, he used to stand, you know, for ibadah the whole night, when these last 10 days comes, you know, 
uh, and he used to wake up his family. So when the night of, uh, you know, when the last 10 days of Ramadan comes, the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam used to tighten his belt, you know, and used to make the night alive. When I'm saying the night alive, it's previously before this night comes, this 10, 10, 10 days comes, he used to sleep uh, some part of the night and wash, uh, involve himself in ibadah from, from some part of the night and also used to rest a little bit. But when it comes to these days, he used to stand in for ibadah, you know, to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in these nights. Why did he do that? Because on these nights, the last 10 nights, there is fihi in it, laylatun, there is a night. Khairun min alfi shaharin, a night which is Better, and not equal, better than thousands of nights to worship. Allahu Akbar. You know, one of the great scholars, he said that, you know, uh, in his Musannaf, he explained that, you know, previous generation, they used to live long. You know, take a look of, for example, Nabi Nuh alayhi salam. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, وَلَقَدْ أَرُسَلْنَا نُوحًا لِقَوْمِهِ We sent Nuh to his people, you know, uh, to give da'wah. And he gave da'wah for 950 years. And that's know? how long he lived. That is how long, you know, the time which he gave da'wah. So, us, we don't have that. No one can live for 950 years. The Prophet <laughs> Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, The lifespan upon my ummah is between 60 to 70, and few they live over, over 70. But Allah give us something, you know, to do. He give us a night. That night which is better than thousand months of worship. You know what is thousand months of worship? You know, if we were to calculate it, 30,000 nights. Subhanallah, and it's 83 years, imagine. Mm -hmm. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said that, do something on that night, you know, and I multiply by 30,000. Now One we, sola, we know that, we don't know which night it is it in is the 10 nights. The there ten are other scholars who believe it's probably even outside of Ramadan. Yes, but yes, be yes. that as it may, the popular belief is yes, 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 that yes. it comes in the last in the 10 last nights of one. Ramadan. Yes, yes. Um, and I, I presume that is why itikaf is so important. I mean, so I mean, talk to us about the 10 nights of itikaf. You know, uh, the reason why, you see, a um, majority of the scholars, they agreed it's more likely on the last 10 nights. The odd nights, right? possibly. More likely on the odd nights. More likely on the second part, meaning more likely on the 25 or on the 27. 27. You see, more likely on the 27, but it doesn't mean that it it, 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 uh, it it can come on the 21st. It can come on the 21st. So to be sure not to miss the barakah of that night, the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam used to do i'tikaf for the last 10 days on all the nights, you know, and to search for this night of power. Because why the virtue of it, you know, they are so great. You know, if everyone, you know, everyone wants a business. It's like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it's like, for example, someone can just say, okay, let me give an example of the latest car, let's say BMW 333i. You know, everyone wants that car, right? So maybe the car is something like, uh, for example, 300,000 runs, right? But they can say that, you know what, on a such and such a day, that car will be, 2,500. What is going to happen? <laughs> Everyone is going, going, to, rush everyone is going to rush for it. And forget see, all the other nights. And forget nights. of other things. You see, mm -hmm. rush for that offer. You know, wait. Let me wait for that night. You see, so Allah is giving us, you know, the opportunity to invest, you know, to do business with Allah. You want to, you know, to do business? Yes, this is the opportunity. I am giving a night. Wherein if you give out sadaqa on that night, I will give you back times 30,000. Imagine if you give 10, okay, let me give you an example. The little is 10 rand is a sodaka sincerely. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala multiplied by 30,000. How much is it? You know, so on these 10 nights, I just want to give everyone advice. You know, let us try to play smart. You know, if you have something to give, it was, you know, if you can give out on this night, it is more rewardable. So if you have something to give, you know, I would encourage, you know, to keep aside, for example, if you want to give 10 rand, you know, if you have 100 rand to give for the sake of Allah, just keep 100 rand and make sure every night so that you, you won't miss that night. Every night you are giving 10 rand, 10 rand, 10 rand. That way you are 100% sure that on the night of power I gave 10 for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Alhamdulillah. What are the do's and don'ts around itikaf? You know, what should you observe and what should you keep away from? And, you know, the akhlaq as far as itikaf is concerned. You know, you see, when I'm taking the word itikaf, it was derived from the word, you know, akatha. 
you know what is akafa you know is to clean you know uh, to stick to something to cleanse yeah to cleanse you know so the word iktikaf is seclusion you know to seclude yourself from you know from all other distractions in coming to the obedience of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that's why Aisha radiyallahu ta'ala anha she said the prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam said it is sunnah for the one who is observing iktikaf you know not to visit the sick person and then not even to attend janaza you know why because you come to allah on these 10 days that ya allah i've come to you you know so you don't want any disturbance and there are some of the things that can break it off. like for example you know to go out of the masjid without any valid you know reason you know unless if you are going out you know to use the toilet that is if there are no toilets by the masjid or uh, if you are going for example to take the food and then then there's no problem but without a reason it can break it off. and also hide in nifas it can also break it off. and also committing major sin it can break the iktikaf. How can you commit a major sin? Yet you are in the, you know, the great sunnah of Nabi Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. You know, when we're talking about the sunnah of Nabi Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, we need to do it. Alhamdulillah, you know, it is, we've come to the end of the show with one, one minute to go. I'm going to let you wrap up. I'm just mm. wondering about iktikaf and cell phones. I mean... Um, you know, of course, it's a yes. means of communication. Maybe yes. just for the family to ask if you're okay and, you know, they're sending the supper, but not to have idle, long conversations and conduct your business whilst you're in itikaf via the cell phone. Yeah, yeah. Now it goes, You know, all deeds are judged according to the intention. Remember, it's between you and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You know, if you have a phone in the masjid, only to receive the message, like, for example, to home and communication, and then there is no problem in that. But to waste your time with your phone, now you're in the itikaf. You know, you're busy playing games, you're busy chatting all the night, and then you are misusing, you're losing the baraka. It is the night we're in. You're supposed to ask Allah forgiveness. You're supposed to make a lot of dua. You're supposed to stand for qiyamul layl. You're supposed to stand for tahajjud and then if you lose that be playing the games and then you are you know you are misusing the night let's wrap up by you reading a uh, surah uh, kadr for um little kadr for us please let's wrap up just uh, end off with that surah okay bismillahir rahmanir rahim Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said in the whole Quran, Inna anzalnahu fi laylatil qadir. Verily, I've reviewed on the night of power. Wa ma adiraka ma laylatul qadir. What made you to know that it is the night of power? Laylatul qadil khayrun min alfi shahr. The night of power, it is better than thousands of months. Why? Tanazzalu al-malaikati wal-ruh. You know, the angels, they come down. Well, roh, meaning angel Jibreel, alayhi salam. You know, and it, salam, it's peace. Hatta matula'il fajr. You know, until fajr. So the whole night, imagine how many angels are they. You know, they say that, you know, each and every day, you know, like in the in, in seventh heaven, there is a house called Baytul Ma'amur, where in each and every day, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created 70,000 angels. They went to do ibadah. They won't come back until the day of resurrection. So on the night, Laylatul Qadir, some, they said it's the night of conjunction, because why? All the angels, they come. Tanazzalu al-malaika. They come, you know, and making the duas for the people. So this is the night which each and everyone, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us to witness the night of power. Amen. Amen. Tama, amen. amen. Jazakallah for being with us. And amen. Wa salam to you. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. That was Sheikh Zubair Malachwa. He truly took us on a spiritual high. Alhamdulillah, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept all of his du'as and let him also remember us all in his du'as. May the rest of Ramadan be as beautiful, as spiritual and as mubarak as it has been up to now. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless you with the night of power, inshallah. We're going for an ad break. Assalamu alaikum and welcome back. It is, uh, we've just kind of passed the midway point or mark of the Mubarak month of Ramadan. And when we talk Ramadan, very especially when we've just passed the halfway mark, we do know that Eid preparations are underway. That also means lots of shopping and uh, Ramadan markets. And one of those has been put together over the past uh, years 
on a regular basis by husband and wife team Sumaya Nanabai and Abdul Kayum Nanabai. And you know, I was talking to them off and they sound very passionate about what they do. I'm kind of thinking about logistics, hard work, sweat, blood, tears, etc. But they're smiling through it all and think that um, it's something that um, they love doing. So let's find out what it's all about, what you can hope to find at the market this Saturday. Um, they'll give us the date, of course. And and why they do it. Assalamu alaikum, welcome to the program. Wa alaikum salam. Whom do I start with? Sumaya, you or your hubby? <laughs> this sounds like a lot of hard work to me, Ramadan markets, and I know that you are involved in other markets and you call yourself S and K markets. Yeah. That leads me to believe that you've perfected the art to the finest detail. How long have you been running? So we've been running since 2007. Um, my background goes uh, in the initial years uh, while I was still in varsity and schooling. Uh -huh. I used to help out with uh, markets with, with some traders and obviously eventually grew into a stage where you know the, the trader or, or the exhibitor would say, you know what, Kayum, um, you run this entire thing for me and then obviously we'll do a profit share agreement at the end and you know it's just built on from that and um, it's more the, the excitement and the joy of meeting new people and obviously you know setting something up and and from then I used to see oh you know these vendors come from all over the world at that time it was the Rand Easter show um, back in the day oh I remember those days yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the I'm excitement not that old, though. <laughs> Yes. Um, and it was it. And you see, you see these people coming from all around the world and there must be something in it. There must be some joy in it or they must, they must be getting some kick out of it. Um, so, yeah, that actually got me interested into that, uh, into this field rather um, initially. But you do have a, a full time yes. job. This is yes. a passion. This is something that you and your wife share. And That's it's right. almost like you're putting back into the community, is it not? Um, I because I, I can't imagine you doing this full time just for the money. <laughs> No, no, no. It's actually more um, a passion and it's something that we want to do for the community. So it's not a, a, a business component, if I can put it that way. We try and keep our costs down as, as low as possible. Um, the primary reason is to give the person or to give the vendor the platform to market their products and obviously um, grow on to, to bigger things. You know, uh, the saying goes, when you support small business, you're supporting a dream. Absolutely. Um, so that's basically what we what we live by. Alhamdulillah. Yeah. Sumaya, how do you feel about it? Because when I look at uh, you know a concept like this, a market S and K markets, and I know that you guys also do nighttime markets. There's a lot of work involved, lots of pre-planning. It just doesn't pop up overnight. No. Um, lots of heartache and tears as well, I should imagine. What's your role in it? But just before you tell me what's your role, when is this market happening? This market is happening this Sunday, the 3rd mm -hmm. of June at Nur Islam Hall. It's a ladies only event. Ah, uh, okay. So where do you feature if it's a ladies only event? Can you? Behind the scenes. Behind the scenes. After and behind the scenes. But I'm not, that's the only part, the only time where I get a rest because when it's ladies only, okay. I get to go home. <laughs> All right. So, Sumaya, I like the concept ladies only because then we as girls can go in and do our thing without bumping and shoving with men and all of that. What's your role in the markets? Okay, basically the ladies only why that came about because the signet market, it's a mixed event. And then I had requests for ladies, you know, Purda ladies, uh, ladies that want to have only ladies only. So that's how come this Ramadan market uh, took off like that. Um, the stall bookings, the advertising, everything from, from the beginning to end, that's where I come in. So he lets so, you do all the hard work all the while hard he work. goes to the office. Lazing with the vendors and the exhibitors, <laughs> it's, it's all of that. Mm -hmm. And has it grown over the years? Gee, Alhamdulillah, it's, been, it's grown. This is the eight year we've been doing it. This year, inshallah, it's going to be a bigger and better event. Um, so shukar. So what can we hope to find when we come to this market? It's tomorrow, am I right? Uh, gee, tomorrow. Uh, the, the, tomorrow Indonesia. at the Nur Indonesia. What can one hope? You know, you, you talk about a flea market, you talk about a Ramadan market or whatever market you talk about. And sometimes people think, oh, it's goodness me, it's going to be same old, same old. Mm -hmm. I understand you're doing something a little different and there's going to be something for everybody. So tell us what is that? Okay. We tried every event for it to be something different and something new all the time. Uh, at this market, we have our some of our regular um, Abaya people. We also have at this market new designers, up-and-coming designers, as well as um, 
the brand and the buyers it's going to be there as well we do have in fashion shows throughout the day oh, that's wow. starting from the afternoon we have a uh, uh, hafida that's going to be doing uh, nasheeds as well Mashallah. we have a lot of gifts and prizes that's a lot of sponsors that's on board as well so we're going to be doing that as well throughout the day a lot of charities as well uh, different organizations and lots of stuff for kiddies as well. We have a kiddies corner so the mommies can leave their kids to, to do their kiddies, uh, the art stuff, and then they can shop in peace. And as always, I should imagine at this market there'll be lots of food and goodies to be bought and you can buy Gee. your food and take it home for iftar. Gee, we do have some of those as well. We have a lady that's going to be selling biryani as well. Oh, wow. Savories, we have in uh, Darun uh, Shifa that's going to be doing a uh, cake sale. They raising funds for the grannies. We also have halim that's going to be sold as well. So there's a variety of food stuff. There's parfi. There's a whole lot of stuff that's going to be sold at there. Kayum, I'm thinking markets and um, the ladies market, the Ramadan ladies market that's going to be happening tomorrow. Uh, but the moment I, you know, think and you know hear about all of these markets being advertised, the one thing that I think about is what you know what's what is going to entice me to go to the bar market? And I should imagine price, <laughs> price and variety. Would I be correct in thinking that? Yes, um, price definitely, because remember the vendors don't have that additional or extended uh, um, shop rental, that type of thing. So the huge costs and overheads uh, are limited. The cost to them are very uh, minimal. Limit, minimal. And um, also we've got vendors coming from as far as KZN <laughs> and all over the country. So um, we're living up to our name and and that's part of SNK markets. So we always try and bring you something new and something different. Um, so that's basically where we're at. So we try and up our game every market, if I can put it that way. And the other different element you're bringing to the market this time around is all of the fun stuff that you're putting on for the kiddies. Um, you're also having arts and crafts and all of that. Talk to us about it. Okay, we actually have a lady that's going to be doing the arts and crafts. She's going to be doing uh, Quran boxes, stuff for Eid gifts as well. A uh, percentage of her takings as well for the day is going to go to charities as well. So that's another... Um, Only cooking. her percentage or the entire market? The entire market as well. But specifically also her arts, uh, she's the, going to be giving it to an organization as well. So uh, her craft, she's got quite a lot of stuff lined up. So that's going to be exciting as well. All right, let's give uh, people a shout out uh, by way of this interview. Give us some names of whom we can hope to see exhibiting at the market. Okay, just for a few that they are, we're going to be having Arabics. Uh, Bahia International Couture, she's from Durban as well. Uh, Doing what? Uh, her Abaya range. Okay. She's got exclusive Abayas as well. We have Rahma Creations. Uh, I have Sure Designs. Uh, petals for Kids, Diamond Closet. Um, there's much, much more. We have perfumes. We have, um, we have a lot of... I don't want to give too much away. No, but, but you must lot. advertise it here. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I have 1728 Mode Street. Uh, there's so many new uh, ladies that's going to be coming into the Lanesia area that uh, Lance hasn't seen before. So it's a must. Absolutely. Starting at what time? It starts at 9, uh, 9 a.m. and it ends at 4 p.m. Is the venue going to be big enough to cater for the hordes of people that you're expecting? <laughs> Gee, inshallah it is. <laughs> Just remind us of the venue again. Okay, it's at Nur al-Islam Hall in Lanesia Extension 5. All right. Um, what would you like to add? We've got about three minutes to wrap up time. Um, yeah, well, this we've, we've got this uh, Ramadan food, fashion and beauty, which is happening uh, tomorrow. Um, also on the 10th of June, we've got a new idea. Actually, Sumaya's uh, a very close friend of hers, um, gave her the idea because um, there's lots of people like to do gifting on Eid and oh, that absolutely. type of thing. And a lot of these markets cater for your Eid clothing and your, your table settings and that type of a thing. And which gave us the the idea um, why don't we set up something different um, by means of an e gift market um, where we'd have this event and uh, people who specifically make gifts and parcels and trays and that type of thing where obviously I'm invited to somebody's house I'm not going to go empty-handed take a tray of nuts or, or that type of thing um, so that type of uh, event is also coming up on the 10th of June that's a brilliant idea yeah so that's it's happening on the 10th of June and yeah. where is that going to be held? That's also in Lanesia at the Umar Farooq Hall 
Um, that's also a first time no, it's never been done before anywhere. So inshallah that we wish that success as well. Start and end times and is it also ladies only event? No, that one's a mixed event. Um, obviously the wives can't uh, buy without the husband uh, the checkbook. checkbook. <laughs> yeah. Or credit card <laughs> these the days. Credit card, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, that's that's a mixed event. Uh, it's at Umar Farouk Hall, um, Lanesia Extension 8. Okay, we're going to wrap up in a minute or two. Your final words? Um, I think... Uh, Come experience and you'll definitely come back going forward again because we always try and better ourselves and bring back new uh, designers. Um, the, the goal is also to get young entrepreneurs into the game, into business as well. So we give them that platform as well from that I aspect. I love that. I love that. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless you guys Amen. with ongoing success because we need to open up avenues for youngsters and of course women who are battling and you know wanting to try and um, become financially independent and here's a brilliant way of doing that so I love what you guys are doing final words from you Sumaya Inshallah I'd like to just say please come and support all the the aunties that's doing all the chevra, <laughs> the savories it's hard work no, it's a lot absolutely. of hard work so please do come and enjoy the day as well Inshallah lots and lots mm. of duas for a massive turnout Inshallah. and lots of luck and success for the Eid Mar Market, which is happening on the 10th of June at the Umar Farooq Hall. Is it the hall? Yes, the the Umar Farooq Hall. Yeah. And that, of course, is a mixed event starting also at 9 in the morning yes, for all your amazing Eid gifts, inshallah. Yes, inshallah. Thank inshallah. you for being with us. I hope to catch up with you guys next year at the same time. Inshallah. inshallah. Obviously, okay. blesses Amen. us with good health and la long life. Inshallah. Keep Inshallah. up the great work. Assalamu alaikum. Of course, there you have it. You can attend the Ramadan market tomorrow, and that is in Lanesha. And they also have an Eid market, which is happening next week, Sunday. They, of course, are the husband and wife team, SK Markets, and you can find them at all the major markets around the country. Still to come, we're going to be talking about books and I can't wait to get my hand on that book. Welcome back. We're into the final segment of the show this morning. We started out on a very spiritual journey with uh, Sheikh Zubair talking about the three concepts of Ramadan. And of course, that was mercy, forgiveness and emancipation. We then went on to Ramadan markets with the husband and wife team. And now we're going to talk about a book. We're going to talk about um, avoiding burnout. We're going to talk to the author because I think this book is almost her personal account and her journey through self-healing. She's now documented it. She's got this book out and she's saying that by way of this book, you too can turn your life around. She is Kathy Mann and her book is called Avoiding Burnout, The Seven Principles of Self-Preservation. And isn't that what it's all about, self-preservation? Yes. Morning, welcome to the show. Thank you, it's great to be here. Lovely to have you here and I must say that you look a picture of perfect health <laughs> and there's this very positive, easy energy that I'm picking up from you. But that wasn't always the case. I mean, no. in the recent past, you didn't have a job any longer. Yeah. The business closed down for whatever reason. Yeah. And I think some of it had to do with your illness, with your disease, your autoimmune disease. Yes. Tell yes. us about that. It must have been a very dark phase and stage in your life. It was very difficult. I, and it took a long time to put that label of burnout on the illness itself. It's a difficult thing to pinpoint because initially the symptoms were just headaches and fatigue. I got more and more exhausted and I had these terrible headaches. And of course, that's quite a hard thing to diagnose for doctors. When you go to the doctor and you say you're tired and you've got a headache, well, it's no wonder with small children and running a business and running marathons, it wasn't a surprise. So oh, you were still running ultra marathons when at the I was time. ill. Yes. <laughs> yes. Whilst you were ill, <laughs> yeah. weren't you afraid yeah. it's going to impact further on your health? Uh, it, I had to stop at a point when I got too ill, and you know that I was only running up to the point where I didn't realize I was so desperately ill. Mm -hmm. And once I got a diagnosis, then I, I had to stop all exercise for about eighteen months. I couldn't even do walking; was even too extreme. So it, it really was a very, very tough time for me and my family. It was difficult to be a mother and, and a wife and that at that time. 
Your husband's also a runner. Yes. He's yes. also an ultra marathon yes. runner. Yes. He yes. has continued that part of his, has he not? Yes. How do you feel? Are you planning on going back to running at some stage? I don't think so. I think um, I've I realized that I was pushing my body too hard and I've learned a little bit of moderation now. So I'm doing a little bit more yoga and I do walking, which is, is more gentle. In time, I might do things like half marathons. I think that'll be great. But ultra marathons are perhaps a little too hard on the body. So, Let's talk yeah. about your life and um, the path that it led you to writing this book. Did you ever imagine that this is going to happen, life's going to happen to you and you're going to then uh, talk about yeah. it by way of a book called Avoiding Burnout? I never imagined this would happen to my life. I, I thought I was working in corporate days before I joined my father's business and I always thought I'd be a, a corporate type person in financial services and offer, uh, operating in the IT field. I always imagined that. And then when I got so desperately ill, I had to really reconnect with who I am and where I'm going. And that then spurred a whole new career path and journey for me. When I was told that I'm interviewing you today and I saw the title of the book and I thought to myself, in those dark moments of your illness, you must have felt very isolated. And yet this book is talking to perhaps 90% of the population. We don't realize that, do we? Yeah, I think, I felt very alone. I didn't realize how stressed I was and how to get out of it. And, um, you know, I did those online assessments that measure your stress and I, I thought I was moderately stressed and not so severely stressed and yet my health collapsed completely. So it is a, a very difficult thing to have that awareness of yourself. So it is important for a spouse who's a concerned spouse to help you see that. That would really help people if you, you know, you can be told by those around you that you're not quite yourself. <laughs> Difficult to hear and to deal with, is it not? Yes. yes. Um, you need to take um, kind of a, a, a self check, introspection. Yeah. You need to then accept that all is not right in your world and you need yeah. to do something to fix it. Yes. How difficult was your journey to healing and then when did you start uh, to document it? The journey was quite difficult. I think I'm, I'm, I've always been an achiever and a, somebody who wants to excel. And I think that's the danger that burnout happens not to, to the lazy people and the slackers of the world. It happens to the high achievers who are pushing that hard. So that was very difficult for me to try to grapple with well, what am I going to do now that I'm actually unable to work for several years and be the person I want to be. So that was hard, but it, it helped me to give a lot of introspection and realize what I'm all about and where I'm going. So stepping and back from life really was a positive thing. Have you documented all of that in the book? Yes. So I started writing, I started my blog probably a few months after diagnosis. And then when I started writing my blog, I realized that people quite benefited from what I was learning about. And then that dawned on me that maybe I could write a book and to share this message a bit further. So that started probably around 2015, the first quarter of 2015, the writing. Yeah. You've achieved a lot in a short three years. Yes. How do you feel about it? I feel great. I feel that this is the right journey for me and I feel at home being a writer. Mm -hmm. That is where I get my joy. Writing is the thing that makes me feel alive. When... Prior to the book um, coming um, you know, into being, <laughs> did you ever imagine earlier on in life that um, you're going to end up writing a book? No, I would never imagine. I think that dream was always there. When I was younger, I always imagined that. And I remember looking back on my goals, even 2003, I always had a little goal there. Do a writing course or write an article. The, the need for writing had always been there underneath. But I always dismissed it as a bit of a um, not serious endeavor. I think often the creative world is seen as not, not real work. So that's how I positioned it in my own mind. Yeah. In this day of technology, um, yes. in this day of instant news and instant everything, instant gratification, um, I kind of wonder, I, I've come across so many writers who've written amazing books from self-help to, yeah. you know, stories of heartbreak and everything else, uh, fiction and non-fiction. Did you kind of, even though your blog was very popular and you got lots of positive feedback, were you not afraid to take the step and think mm -hmm. that, you know, 
who's going to read the book? <laughs> yeah, I was very afraid. And I wrote a lot about, it's a very much my personal journey. So there is a lot of my personal life in there and how difficult it was for my husband and I to navigate this illness and, you know, a lot of family member difficulties. So it is very difficult and frightening to expose yourself to the world in this way. But I think in writing about our own stories, that's how we help others to heal and to relate to something like that that can help themselves. I have no doubt in my mind that books like these, you know, documenting your personal journey, very definitely touches lives and um, very especially people going, you know, through a similar you know, journey like yours. Yes. Tell us about your disease. You know, the moment I hear autoimmune, I'm thinking chronic, you know, you're going yeah. to live with it for the rest of your life. Yes. What sort of lifestyle changes did you have to make? I know the running stopped, yes. sadly. Yes. Uh, and, and how long did it take you to get back to where you are as you're sitting here in front of me, the picture yes. of perfect health? <laughs> it took about three years to sure. recover, which is quite extreme. Um, but I, it took a long time to try to understand how to address those aspects of my health. So I got a lot of help from doctors and I And changed. that is documented in the book? Yes, mm -hmm. and I, I listened to all my doctors very carefully and I followed their advice. I also did my own research and empowered myself to understand how I need to change my diet, how gen more gentle exercise would be of benefit, how getting more sleep helps to boost my health. So I learned a whole array of things with, that I share in the book around how to recover and and that's part of what I want to share for people who don't know what to do when they get this sick. Now, obviously, we're going to encourage people to go out and buy this book because I'm sure it's going to be life changing once you've read the book. Uh, but I do want to unpack some of the stuff that you went through and led you to the writing and the publishing of the book. What exactly is autoimmune disease? Normally when yes. I talk about a health issue, I normally have a healthcare professional on the yes. show. But here you're going to be sharing something very personal. You yes. were the patient. What was mm -hmm. going on with you? Yes, yeah, so for my health, I had two aspects that were affected and both in the endocrine system. So my adrenal glands, which sit on top of the kidneys, and they are the ones that release cortisol and adrenaline. They're the ones that, that release that stress hormone. So those were really struggling and the, the function of those diminished quite dramatically. And because I didn't really care for myself, I just ignored it and carried on going as you do. I then developed an autoimmune disease called Hashimoto's thyroiditis. So that is a, a, a disease of the thyroid, which means my immune system is attacking the thyroid gland in the throat. And that thyroid gland governs energy, metabolism and various other processes. So Did both, you find that you'd uh, maybe lost a lot of weight or put on weight? Or yes, hard? yes. I gained weight, I think, from the stress. Mm -hmm. and, then, um, and then I did lose weight eventually when I, when I came right again. And that is another area of depression, especially yes. with us girls. Yes. If you lose or put yes. on too much weight, I mean, it's almost yes. like your world's come to an end. Yes. And it was quite difficult for me because I couldn't exercise and I loved exercise. So I gained this weight. I took my medication. I did my best to be healthy. I couldn't go on radical diets because I was trying to eat well and I couldn't exercise so that was quite a difficult place to be yeah. very frustrating it's <laughs> yes, very frustrating okay let's stop for our first ad break I'm talking to Kathy Mann she's written this amazing book called avoiding burnout the seven principles of self-preservation and if you are stuck at some place in your life whether it's through a physical illness or mentally you're being blocked out for you know have a blockage for some reason or the other or even if you're having relationship problems get the book read it it's about you it's about preserving your life your surroundings your frame of mind and once you're better everything just seems to fall into place so says Kathy Mann and I do believe what she says so stay with us we'll continue the, the discussion right after the ad break The Seven Principles to Self-Preservation is a book written by Kathy Mann and you don't necessarily have to be suffering from an autoimmune disease. Whatever issues that you are facing in life right now, this book will talk to you. It will probably help you realign 
reassess your current situation and then try and put things back into perspective and work at it of course it doesn't happen magically. Kathy's journey took more than three years but as you can see she's a picture of perfect health and may she always remain so. Kathy, back to your illness and yes. um, you were talking to us about the autoimmune disease. Yes. I understand you were misdiagnosed at some stage as well. How did that, yes. you know, how did that impact on you and how far back did it push you? It's, it was very disappointing to realize that I, I sought help from my GP, my um, normal physician, and she sent me to a surgeon. And this, uh, I, I'm not sure why a surgeon, because they don't typically deal with hormones and, and long-term autoimmune disease. They, they typically will cut out something that's not functioning. So the surgeon gave a diagnosis, and then only after about a year or so, I ended up at, a, at the proper specialist, which is an endocrinologist. What happened in the interim? He gave me some medication, and I did get a little bit better. But I have found out that he should have treated the adrenal glands first instead of the thyroid first. Ooh. So I found out from other specialists I've seen subsequently that that delayed my recovery by a year. And that's quite tragic if you think about the loss of financial um, you know, uh, income and the difficulty for my children. And you must have been too. disappointed and angry. Yeah. And you were sick on top of it. How did yeah. you deal with all of that? I tried to employ a lot of forgiveness and understanding and to realize that perhaps it happened for a reason and I, maybe I needed the full three years to take stock of my life. Maybe it's just part of the journey. You, when you get that sick, I think you have to really learn that patience and be patient with yourself and the process to get better. That's very mm. magnanimous of you. <laughs> <laughs> there was a lot of anger at the time. I'm sure. Yeah. But, but it's also, you know, you often hear the saying that what you put into the universe is what you get back. Yeah. And um, I'd like to think that as angry and as disappointed as you are, if you just kind of forgive and try mm. and move on, the yeah. good things, the positivity will come back into your life. Yes. It'll flow back into your life. And that probably is what happened. Yeah, I think it lowers your stress levels when you realize that perhaps this was the right thing for me and you know the, it's not good for your stress to, uh, to worry about all those things that you actually can't change. You were very um, sick. I know that yeah. people become very ill when they have an autoimmune disease. You've yes. just indicated you were fatigued all of the time. Yeah. Um, and obviously it must have taken a lot out of you. I'm thinking your marital relationship, I'm thinking you had minor children I think at the time. Yes. How did you cope and what, what did your support system look like? Because you, can't, you couldn't have done yeah. it without uh, support. Yes, it was very difficult uh, for us and I think it took a long time for us to figure out the way through it. But I, what, one of the major things I learned was to ask for help. So I was always one of these capable people. And then I, when I started getting so sick, I thought, oh, my husband married this capable person. How can I now <laughs> ask for help? But I realized I really do have to lean on him and ask him for help. And I learned to be very specific. In the past, I said, oh, I'm overwhelmed. And there was nothing he could do with that. But then I started to really hone in and say, I need you to take the kids out for three hours on a Saturday, and then I can sleep and rest. And then he had something that he could action and do. And he, of course, he did that. And he did all the things I asked for. So that helped a lot. Remarkable. Yeah. And mm -hmm. he started doing, I was too fatigued to attend things like the children's parties. So he attended the children's parties. And I learned to do things like shopping for gifts online. <laughs> and from that, he forged quite a lot of good relationships with the fathers. And then they, they go out for meals with the dads, which is really great. So. You know what I'm thinking here as we speak about uh, mm -hmm. your illness and the support you got from your husband. Mm -hmm. uh, you were ill as it is, you were very mm -hmm. sick, um, helpless, in a very helpless and hopeless yeah. situation and here your husband took charge. Yeah. But in the back of your mind, were you even, and I'm sure that you did have those doubts that what's this going to do to my marriage? Yes. It was very worrying because I really had to lean on him so much. He had to work a full day at work. He had to come home and cook for the children. It was hard for us. And it was difficult to explain. Fatigue is something you can't see. And I, it was very, I did feel very helpless in not being able to assist him and support looking after the children and things. It was tough. But we've weathered the storm. We married for over 11 years. Oh, and wonderful. <laughs> and may you have side. many, many, many happy years together. Thank you. For other people reading this book, it yeah. doesn't matter what situation or what illness that they are dealing with, 
what are they going to find that's going to be helpful for them? I think a lot of the principles give great guidance in terms of how to make your life better, even if you aren't sick. So some of them, for example, I think the most fundamental principle, which is number one, is the principle of knowing yourself. So I was doing the work that was opposite of my strengths for a long time in a stressful environment, and that was not sustainable. So if you know that, if you read about that in the book and you realize, let me align my work with my values, with my strengths and talents, then life is enriched regardless of whether you're well or sick. So that's the kind of thing that people can glean from the book to align their lives with the best possible outcome so that they can live a happy life. This, is, this, this book isn't only targeted at people who are battling an illness. Yes. Anybody that just wants to get their house in order, yes. they could read this book and be able to start putting things in place yes. in their lives. What would that be? I think things like relationships. Sometimes we don't realize that our relationships are not healthy. I realized that I wasn't asking my husband enough for help. I realized there were some people I was spending a lot of time with that weren't really good for me or good to me. So now I really, on purpose, spend time with those who love and support me, and I spend a lot less time with those who don't. So, and only the illness was a big catalyst for that to really look at my relationships and decide whether they're worthwhile or not. So that was a great lesson and many of the principles offer those kind of insights that help people create that better life. We get back to um, other chapters of the book, but as you sit here talking to me about the book and about avoiding burnout, um, what's, your, what's your situation with uh, autoimmune di diseases? Yeah. Um, can we use the term remission? Are you in remission at the moment? Yes, so my, my lifestyle is now back to normal. I can work a full day and I can exercise and I can still have enough energy for my family. So that was always my goal. Once you have an autoimmune disease, you have it for life. So those antibodies that reside in your blood, they will be there forever. It's now a matter of just managing it, going regularly to the doctor, managing my health, getting enough sleep, taking my medicine, just looking after myself as well as I can. About 20 odd years ago, there was um, this catchphrase, uh, people were using it and they were talking about yuppie flu. Yeah. Is that what we're referring to here? I think so. I, I have that, that suspicion that particularly on the ad adrenal side, people mm. talk about adrenal fatigue a lot. Mm -hmm. And these days the medical profession has given it a more correct medical name, mm -hmm. which is actually HPA axis dysregulation. So that HPA axis is part of the endocrine system. And that is when, for example, your um, adrenals are pushing out so much cortisol that your body compensates by changing the hormone balance. And that's when you're getting the fatigue and you're struggling. And I, I have a suspicion that the yuppie flu was probably related to something like adrenal fatigue. Yeah. I know that you were very fatigued at the time <clears throat> and I marvel at the fact that you've, you know, a book has come out of it because just the thought of writing a book is, yes. uh, is such a huge task. Yeah. When, how did you start and did you yeah. ever wonder, are you self-published by yes, the I'm way? Yes, I'm self-published, okay. yes. And, yes. And I mean it's an expensive exercise. Yes, yes. So what drove you in that direction, <laughs> apart from helping other people of course? Yes, I, I have a friend who calls me an overachiever <laughs> for writing a, a book while I'm burning out because she just you know, likes to point fun at me, but that is the kind of person that I am, you know. I think I had this crisis when I got sick to realize, well, if I have no job title, who am I and what, and what am I going to do with my life? And then when I started, as I say, writing the blog, it was helping people, and then I started writing the book, and I thought, well, this is actually, I get quite a lot of joy out of writing. At a time when I was not very joyful because I was struggling so much, the writing itself, the exercise of writing, was the only thing that gave me energy. And you talk in the book about yeah. getting in touch with your creative side. So yes. is that what you were doing? Yes, yes. And I, I believe the same friend who calls me an overachiever, she said to me, she guided me a lot in this time when I was really struggling. And she said that a lot of the people who struggle in, in corporate environments with stress, they have those day away workshops where they just do Lego and things like that to just connect with creativity and have a little bit of fun. And that allows the brain to relax and then the effects of stress to dissipate. So she encouraged me to do creative work to help reduce those effects of stress, particularly initially. Yeah.
Okay, let's go for our next ad break. Kathy Mann, the author, is my guest. She's written her first book, Congratulations. And it's called, obviously, Avoiding Burnout. And I think we all need to read this because at some point in our lives, whether we're suffering from a disease or not, we do live in very, very stressful environments. And we all want to be super women. Um, I think we need to read the book. I think we need to slow down and just put our lives into perspective. Don't go away. We'll be back with you in a minute or two. I hope you enjoyed. Kathy Mann is the author of a book called Avoiding Stress, The Seven Principles of Self-Preservation. And we all need to work on these seven principles. We need to preserve our sanity more than anything else. If we don't, we very definitely will burn out. And she, of course, had uh, been diagnosed with an autoimmune disease and it took three years out of her life. But I don't think it was a waste of three years. The results of that uh, three years, which at the time she probably thought is a waste, that she's lost three years of her life, this is what has resulted from that. So everything happens in our lives for a reason, does it not? Yes, I believe that honestly. And, and this was a real catalyst for me to change my life dramatically and for the better. Uh, you know, a lot of, you're right, quite right, I did think it was a waste at some point and I was so frustrated throughout the journey, journey of healing. And then at the other side, I really feel very grateful for this opportunity because I would never have reorganized my life the way I did if I hadn't burnt out. How much of introspection were you going through at the time? Yeah. A lot because I wasn't able to go out much because I was really exhausted. I limited myself to five outings a week. I found I got too exhausted otherwise. So one of those would just be going to the shops for toiletries and then that was all I could manage. So I spent a lot of time alone and I am quite a thinker. So I did a lot of this internal churning and processing and analyzing where did the stress come from? What should I do to fix it? And how do I restructure my life to make it a better life? In this process, you can become a warrior yes. and a nag. Yes. And you could, in the process, also wear people down, the people around you, to the yeah. point where they could kind of just cut themselves off from you. Yeah. Did that happen? Yeah. I think uh, some of my relationships... Uh, changed because I wasn't able to participate much. It's difficult to be a friend and to maintain business networks when you don't really go out of the house. So that sort of happened naturally um, and that was a bit disappointing. Some of the friends I thought I could really lean on, I couldn't. And other acquaintances who I thought were just marginal friends, they came over to look after my children while I slept. Wow. So it showed me the value of the relationships I had. It gave me great insights into the people who were really there for me. And people's perceptions change about you during the time don't they because yes. there are those friends yes. or colleagues or um, <laughs> you know relatives etc who don't understand what you're going through they don't understand yes. the journey the difficult journey yeah. that you're undergoing they think you're being offish you're being snobbish yeah. and you're trying to cut yourself you're isolating yeah. you're isolating yeah. them yes um, and because mm -hmm. they don't understand they kind of cut themselves off from you yes or they just think you are lazy you know you've just become this lazy person who just loafs around at home and doesn't do anything and that wasn't what was happening I had this t tremendous turmoil inside of me that I couldn't achieve things and there were many people who didn't understand that. So it, it was a difficult time. Did you have the energy to explain yourself or were you just not, 
so tired, so fatigued that you couldn't be bothered explaining yourself. I did explain to the people who asked and that I benefited from. I think often when people are very ill, nobody wants to talk about it. But actually the person who's ill does want to talk about it and you do. And, you know, often friends said, well, what is it like and, and what are you going to do now and, and things. And that was a great opportunity for me to explain. I think the sad part was when people just made assumptions and, and didn't ask. Yeah. Let's talk about your children. It must yeah. have been so difficult yeah. for you not to be able to do the mommy, yes. kitty things that you would normally do. Yes. Did they realize that you're sick? You know, how was yeah. that? How did yeah. that conversation play out? Because that must have been very important between yeah. your hubby, yeah. the kids and you. Yes. So once I got diagnosed, we explained to the children what happened, what has happened and that mom's got sick from stress. And, you know, it was very difficult, particularly for my three year old to understand that. And she, we said, we, mommy needs a lot of sleep and rest. But, you know, two days later, she says, will you do this with me? Will you do that with me? You know, she didn't understand. And sadly, my, my oldest thought that it was her fault. She thought she, she she caused it because you know she was too noisy with her playing so it took some time to explain that to her and I also asked that she could see the school counselor because I think she connected with me very much and to see me lying in bed and not being able to be the person I was before it was hard for her in particular people yeah. watching us this morning and are going yeah. through perhaps a similar journey yeah. that you went through what are the do's and don'ts that you would uh, you know advise on family, friends, children yes. especially, and your spouse. Yes. What would you say is very important? Well, a couple of things. I think leaning on your spouse, learning to ask for help and very specific help. That's very important. You were very fortunate. You had a very, you have a very, very supportive yes. husband. Yeah. It's yeah. not always the case with other people. Yeah. Yeah. And in that case, then perhaps leaning on somebody who can help you a lot. We have a, a wonderful nanny at home as well. And she is a great blessing because she also assists me a lot. I also asked her for specific help with certain things and, and that's been a great help and other friends and relatives just to ask for help is a really important lesson sometimes we suffer in silence and want to bear it all and when we're that sick we do need the support and often people like to help that friend who came over when my children were young she played with them and had two or three hours of playing while I slept and it was a great help and she was glad to do it so people do like that mm -hmm. yeah what else should people be avoiding or doing more of during this time? Yeah. And I should imagine uh, yeah. it's all in your book. Yes, yes, absolutely. Yeah. I think do more <laughs> of take good care of yourself. So uh, the principle three is talking about um, prioritizing self-care. So often I was of the assumption that my needs were not important and everybody else, I needed to look after all these other people. But because I did that, I got myself into a position where I wasn't of use to anybody. So looking do after myself. Do you feel myself, guilty during that time, beat up on yourself and feel very yes. guilty? Yes, now here I am and look, I've done this to myself. Yeah. <laughs> so that wasn't great. So yeah. learning to look after yourself first, you know, that, that notion of take the oxygen mask so that you can be the mother and the wife and the friend that you want to be. So to, prioritizing that self-care is really important as well. Um, sleep, a lot of sleep. People are really cutting corners with sleep. And people brag about how little they sleep and how they're struggling on a few hours and propping themselves up with coffee. That's not a good thing to do. Mm -hmm. Rather have a great night's sleep. You feel fantastic. <laughs> and I guess we all think that we want to, the, to, to, to be the best at anything and everything we do. But what we're really doing is we're competing against ourselves. Nobody yeah. else cares. No. No, because everybody no. has the same thought that we're having. Yeah. I want to be the best. Yes. We but stretch ourselves so thin mm. and, um, and then eventually we break if we push mm -hmm. too far. Okay. Yeah. Avoiding burnout, the seven principles of self-preservation. It has worked for you. Yes. You are the picture yes. of perfect health. <laughs> um, so pleased to see yes. how you've got your life together. Thanks. You've got the book. Yeah. What comes after this and what, is, what does your future look like? Yeah, I love doing a lot of public speaking, so I, I enjoy that a lot. And, and that's a way for me to spread this message to the world about how to look after yourself and, and avoid getting this sick. I'm also busy writing the follow-up book um, called Healing Burnout, and that's more about the healing process and how to invest in your sleep and your diet and lifestyle in order to get better once you are diagnosed. How different will it be from this book? I think that one focused very much on my journey on the way there. I'm not going to talk so much about that this time. I'm going to talk about how you fix the problem more. <laughs>
How have people responded to the book? Uh, wonderfully. I've got some really great reviews. I have the, in fact, my hundredth reader said wow. to me that um, the book started making a change in his life completely. Once he read that, he stepped back and took stock. So that was wonderful. And um, I've got some wonderful reviews online. I'm very pleased about the reception of the book so far. I'm thinking about young people uni yeah. students or you yes. know young people having entered their first job or newly yeah. married couples yes. what do you think this book will be saying to them i think that would help them set themselves up for success because often we we bumble around life quite reactively and we don't really live on purpose it's so important for me that we live with real purpose and design our lives to be exactly how we want them to be. And I think that's what can offer young people. Um, and I'm always telling people not to make the mistakes that I made. <laughs> Is there ever anything like the perfect job and the perfect <laughs> life? <laughs> no, but um, it's really important to enjoy the things that you do have to stop and make the most of what's around you. It doesn't have to be perfect. No. Love it yes, despite anyway. it being less perfect. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> and that's what I often think about those three years of recovery. I look back and I think, oh, it was such a struggle. But you know what? It was quite a magical time because it was the transformation into something new. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Apart from the second book that I know you're busy writing right now, yes. five years hence, what can we expect from Kathy Mann? Hopefully many more books and wow. lots of exciting speaking engagements. And um, I'm also working on a deck of cards that match um, the principles of self-preservation. So if you're wondering what you want to do, focus on today, you can just pick a card and realize, okay, today I'm going to look at self-care and, and being kind to myself. So the deck of cards should be quite a fun accompaniment as well. Yeah. In closing, what a turn your life has taken, <laughs> yes. but hopefully by way of this book you're going to be sharing that life-changing adventure with other people and teach them how to heal themselves by way of this book. What do you want to say to our viewers this morning? I want to say life is a wonderful journey and sometimes the experiences we think are the most difficult are, are really a gift. So grab it with both hands Absolutely. and yeah, enjoy you it. Can, <laughs> you can either look at the glass half full or half <laughs> yes. empty. Yes. Kathy Mann, it's been lovely Thank talking you. to you. Thank I look you so forward much. to your next book and I do wish you ongoing good health <laughs> and total recovery. Thank you so much for having me. It's been wonderful. Lovely to have you here. Okay. Kathy Mann talking about her book, Avoiding Burnout, The Seven Principles of Self-Preservation. You don't have to be ill. You don't have to be on any form of journey. Just read the book. The one thing that you will walk away with is to introspect and to realize and to put into perspective what is important in life and what not. So don't waste your time and your life and your energy on unimportant little things. Life is way too beautiful, too rich and too wonderful to waste away and wish away. Thank you for being with me. Been wonderful having you on the show this morning. Till Wednesday at the same time as always, take care on the roads and Khudafis from me, Julie Ali.